Food System Network, which is a local group of people working within the food system. Um, our network's council consists of representatives from organizations, agencies, businesses, and groups who are all working on various aspects of the food system related to agriculture, health, and nutrition. These groups include All Care, Rogue Farm Corps, Access, Sodexo and the Three Rivers School District, Folia Farms, the uh, Southern Oregon University, Rogue Valley Farm to School, OSU Small Farms, By George Farm, and the Josephine County Blue Zones. And I just wanted to take a minute to ask um, those of our council members who are in the audience to just stand up. So if you'd like to learn more, they're all clustered together, it looks like. If you'd like to learn more about the Food System Network, these are great people to talk to. The network's purpose is to convene conversations related to food, agriculture, and nutrition in the Rogue Valley. We also support new projects that are related to food, and we provide forums for people working on these issues to network and seek solutions together. So last year, the Rogue Valley Food System Network met to discuss the priorities for the 2017 annual year. Uh, the growth and development of the cannabis industry was noted as the priority focus by multiple components of the food system. Stakeholders noted the potential for changed land use law, water use, markets, and collaborative opportunity as reasons to explore this changing landscape. Agricultural landscape change is a common occurrence as it is in Southern Oregon University, at Southern Oregon and throughout the country. An agricultural emphasis on pears, grapes, and cannabis are just three of our most recent industries. But a dive into our history suggests that we've done much more. We were at one time known for our production of prunes, for peaches, for walnuts, for our dairies, for tulips, and more. The expansion of the cannabis industry is perhaps one of the more complex landscape changes we have faced based on federal versus state legal dynamics, economic potential, and a long history of prohibition that has led to the need to rediscover thoughtful growing practices and regulations. Despite the complexity, it is clear that the changing face of agriculture in the region poses outstanding opportunities and very real challenges for existing business. My hope in facilitating ongoing discussion this year is to leverage opportunity and thoughtfully plan and mitigate for challenges. I've been impressed already this year as we've met in various groups by the willingness of so many to volunteer both time and talent to conversations that will improve our region. Thank you for your civility, for your willingness to learn from one another, and your love for our remarkable region. I hope our panel presentation tonight will be interesting and informative. So just a little bit tonight on and how we're going to move forward. Uh, so we don't have a policy agenda. That's not our intent. Uh, the Rogue Valley Food System Council is an educational body. That's our hope tonight is to inform. So tonight will be about thoughtful di dialogue that we hope will illuminate the opportunities and challenges associated with a changing landscape. We hope that this dialogue will lead to informed decision making, business ventures, and planning. But our goals as an organization is exclusively to promote shared understanding. Our goal tonight is to help promote an understanding of the way in which the cannabis industry interacts with other aspects of the agricultural industries in the region. We have designed our limited time together to promote an understanding of a wide variety of issues tied to that changing agricultural landscape. We are not here to judge or criticize any perspective or any industry. We are also not a policy-making body. We are simply here as an educational facilitator. This meeting will be followed by a series of community-based conversations with interested stakeholders. We invite all of you to participate in those meetings and we'll provide time at the end of this panel presentation tonight to connect you with the individuals facilitating each of those discussions. You will note that several of the communities that will be represented in those discussions are up on the wall right now. We'll be organizing folks who are interested in participating in those discussions into those communities at the end of tonight's discussion. So our panel discussion today will not be a venue for sharing our own individual perspectives or experiences, but each of those community conversations will be, and we hope that you'll participate. Tonight, we've invited key stakeholders to address us in a spirit, in an area of expertise. We invite you to listen, to take notes, and to learn. We hope that many of you will be able to join us in our community conversations for further discussion with a much broader understanding of our region based on what you learned tonight. Please join us this evening for a civil and respectful opportunity to learn from each other. 
Your goal tonight is primarily to listen and to understand the perspectives of others. Your opportunity to articulate your own perspective will be presented during those community-based conversations, which will be held in August, September of this year. As our panelists speak tonight, you may find yourself with questions. As questions come to mind, please raise your hand and you will be handed an index card in which to write your questions. Stu and Megan will be providing those index cards. There's Stu, Megan's on the news outside at the moment. Um, we have a very limited amount of time tonight and depending on how many questions are posed, we may or may not get to all of them, but we're gonna do our very best to try to answer all the questions or to allow our panelists to answer our questions. Um, I'd ask you to remember that we're not in any position to steer legislation nor do we have any interest as a body, as the Rogue Valley system, Food System Network in doing so today. We hope that you will enjoy hearing from our expert stakeholders this evening, meeting professionals in your field, and promoting shared understanding with those in the room. So with that, Maud's gonna introduce our panelists tonight. So we've, I don't know how well you can see the agenda that's up here, but we've given our panelists about 10 minutes each, and we've asked them to respond to four questions that we'll um, put, in, it's the next PowerPoint slide, so we'll post that so you can see what the questions we requested them to answer. So I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce the panelists now all at once. Siobhan Hayes, Haynes is our first speaker. He, he's the Oregon Water Resource Department District 13 Water Master serving Jackson County. Siobhan has worked for OWRD for around 13 years and has lived in Southern Oregon most of his life. Chris Jagger, our second panelist, is owner operator of Blue Fox Farm, a 40 acre organic vegetable farm in the Applegate Valley of Southern Oregon. He's also the owner head consultant for Blue Fox Agricultural Services, a full service agricultural supply and co consultation company focusing on ecological solutions for the modern farmer. Both his farm and his agricultural services use living soils as the foundation to scale farming operations efficiently and profitably. Daniel Sweeney, our third panelist, is a viticulturalist and farm labor contractor working in the Rogue and Applegate Valleys. He was manager at Quail Run Vineyards for four years and has worked on farms and vineyards around the country for the last 15 years. Josh LaBombard, our fourth panelist, is the Southern, Southern Oregon Regional Representative for the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. He covers Jackson, Josephine, and Douglas counties. Josh has been with the state for close to six years. Our next panelist is Megan Lanier. Have I said that right? <laughs> um, Megan has a strong background in technical research and writing and over 14 years of experience in land use consulting. She thrives on helping clients navigate the permitting system to guide and assist in making property owners' ideas a reality. Having been in the Valley for the last 15 years, Megan has developed a great working relationship with Jackson County and other local and state departments. And our final panelist is Michael Johnson. He's a cannabis industry professional who currently is the chief of operations for Siskiyou Sungrown, a recreational producer and processor. Michael has extensive cannabis industry experience with previous executive roles in retail, wholesale distribution, farming, and extraction facilities. So, as Vince mentioned, we won't be taking questions, but if you'd like to have a question posed to the panel after the completion of the panel, please raise your hand um, and someone will bring you a note card and a pen. And with that, I think we'll have Siobhan come up. Good evening. Um, my name is Siobhan Haynes and I am the Water Master for District 13, which covers uh, Jackson County. So, um, of course, you know, with cannabis cultivation comes water use. And most any cannabis cultivation requires the, the need of a water right. And so the agency I work for is the agency that issues water rights for many different uses. And the majority of uses that use water in this area is for irrigation. And so with cannabis cultivation, with many things, if you're gonna grow something, you need to water it, and if you're gonna grow it to sell it, you need to have a water right. So there's many types of water rights, like I said, mostly it's for irrigation. Um, a lot of the interest for this area right now is been, has been well water use. Um, you know, there's different types of cannabis cultivations. There's the OLCC Avenue, and there is the Medical Avenue. So anything that is the OLCC Avenue has to have a specific certificate of water right. 
um, if you're doing stuff with um, the medical side, then you can use your well that doesn't require water out. So this is a handout that we give to most any water user. It's kind of geared towards cannabis cultivation, showing like the exemptions um, for water use from a well that don't require a water right. And so the main exemption that we are concerned about here is the watering of up to a half of an acre of a non-commercial lawn and garden. And so that's a lot of the stuff that we have we deal with nowadays is trying to figure that fine line between what is considered commercial and what would be considered allowable under the groundwater exemption. And so pretty much if you're watering something under a half of an acre and you're not selling it, you can use your well, your well water without needing a water right. So next slide, yeah. And so um, kind of a few observations that we've, stuff we've dealt with recently. We've had an increase in new groundwater right applications in the Rogue Basin. Um, a lot of those groundwater right applications um, don't get approved because of the proximity of that well to a surface water source. And we've been seeing a large number of complaints and concern about water use directly towards um, cannabis cultivation. So next slide. So there's a little slide just showing the number of groundwater applications uh, my agency has received since 2004. Uh, we received about 40 groundwater applications in the Rogue Basin, mostly Jackson and Josephine County, until January 2015. And so since January 2015, this graph is a little old, we've received 100 and uh, 106 groundwater, groundwater applications in the 18 month period. 58 of those have been in Jackson County and 46 of those have been in Josephine County. And majority of those have all been directly associated with some type of a cannabis cultivation. Um, the real interesting thing about this is it's a different type of use. Um, most of the irrigation or water use in the area is specifically irrigation. 95% um, of these new applications are for a character of use that is considered nursery. And what that nursery use allows folks to do is water for um, a longer period of time. So next slide. And so uh, a lot of times when we might see we get called out for water use issues directed towards um, cannabis cultivation, it's you know has to deal with the half acre exemption. Oh, thanks. Uh, the has to deal with the half acre exemption. And so what we have to do a lot is we're doing a lot of just simple geometry, uh, counting plants and raised beds or circles and grow bags. And um, we're finding a lot of the time, a lot of the complaints that were received, um, most people are within that half acre watering because they're within a, uh, the medical component. Um, some other things we're seeing is like the type different um, changes in irrigation methods. Um, here's an aerial photograph of the same piece of property over time. Um, the first photo showing you know typical sprinkler irrigation. So this landowner is using water over um, I think it's about a five acres or so and sprinkling the entire parcel. But because the crop got changed to cannabis, it's you know a drip system. So in fact, you know they're using a lot less water, but having the same type of footprint over the use. Um, this image is kind of a similar thing. It's a, from flood irrigation to a drip system. Um, the image on the upper right is you know typical flood irrigation out in the um, Williams Creek area where they different crop type now, it's cannabis, so no more flood, it's sprinkle, so I'm using a little less water. And I just threw in this picture of a friend of mine, his son, um, on a different piece of property, but I really like it because it shows, you know, some of the old flood irrigation methods, you know, siphoning water from the ditch, flooding property. Um, we've been working a lot with irrigation districts. Um, you know, most irrigation districts operate on a flood irrigation, um, but with the new industry of cannabis, um, you know, not having to flood anymore, but bulging those that water use, 
banking it in a small temporary um, facility and then applying it to lands as they meet see fit. So here's another example of you know what was historically flood irrigation, but a new crop type coming in and using water a little bit more efficiently. And that's pretty much about all I was talking about. But and I'm sure if there's lots of questions, and I'll feel free to answer more questions at the end. Hi, I'm Chris Jagger, uh, Blue Fox Farm out in the Applegate Valley. Um, I've been out there for about 15 years growing up to 40 acres of vegetables and um, I've seen the changing landscape since we've been here. Um, not, not, for the, not for the worst at all, I don't think. Um, it's just different. Um, and one thing I would really like to point out to everybody is that this is a very nuanced conversation. I think it goes way beyond just cannabis. Um, I think it's an agricultural converse, conversation that we should all be having. Um, and I think in relation to the food system, I, I'm personally seeing the food system change rapidly. Um, I think cannabis has, a, has an effect on it, um, but I also think that there's uh, bigger, uh, bigger players um, at, at the food system right now, which is consolidation and corporatization uh, versus food system. And so that's something that actually I'm more um, more concerned about but tonight what we're talking about is how cannabis is affecting the food system and what i would say is i'm, I'm talking about soils and soil fertility and soil is the number one thing to me as a vegetable farmer um, and that comes right down to this whole concept of stewardship um, and we all we all can be stewards to our piece of land that we're on it's just how we decide to steward that land and so what i would say is that i have seen vegetable farmers steward land effectively. I've seen cannabis farmers steward land effectively. I've seen horse ranchers steward land effectively. And I've seen orchardists and vineyardists effectively. I've also seen the complete flip of that as well. And so I think it's something that we all need to be careful is not to generalize whenever we're trying to look at new, uh, new things that are coming into our lives because I, I, I can be really quick myself to make opinions and um, which probably four or five years ago if you had asked me my opinion on this it would be very different than what it is now and four or five years ago I saw as the landscape was changing and all of a sudden I didn't have the same workforce available to me um, and I very quickly said oh it must be these cannabis farms that are coming in and they're, they're taking all my workers you know um, but then I I pride myself in not jumping to conclusions and really investigating more deeply and saying, well, what actually is taking all of my workers away? Um, and, and, and this does relate with soil because I know that's what I'm talking about. Um, and so I started looking at that and I started reverse engineering back and I said, okay, well, where are all, where is the workforce and, um, and why is that limiting how much land I can grow on, which means increase my, increase my production. And, have a viable viable livelihood and I started looking around and realizing that the workforce was going away for a multitude of reasons um, increase in increase in labor costs um, the fact that I think that our our culture nowadays doesn't value hard labor and hard work the same that we have in the past um, and also just that there's a lot of other places that people can go and 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 make better money and so I said well Let's, let's look at this and see where I can help this industry um, make a change. Because I, I had this, these wonderful class one soils and I was like, man, I'm in this class one soils and I'm, I'm working it. And I started seeing soil trucks coming around the valley and, and I was like, well, why are people bringing soil in? Because I had no idea at all, you know? Um, and I started looking into like, well, where, where is all this soil going and what is it doing, you know? Um, and as I investigated that, I, I realized that it wasn't just everybody that was growing cannabis was bringing soil in. There were people like Michael's, Michael's farm that are going in the ground. And, and, and I said, wow, I shouldn't just go ahead and blanket statement and say, you know, this industry is doing this because that wasn't the case at all. And so I started going case by case. And then I started putting my, my name out there and saying, hey, I want to know more about your industry. And then all of a sudden, the cannabis industry started reaching out to me and saying, well, we want to know more about what you're doing because we're going to start scaling up here as, as legalization comes on and we want to figure out how to farm on scale. And 
so I realized that there was this place for this conversation to start happening, you know, and I said, well, man, I need to create a venue for this and, and how do I facilitate this? Um, and so I created Blue Fox Ag Services as a way to consult and interact with people and, and yet continue my living. Um, and then I also created um, the Living Soil Symposium as just a venue to get everybody together and start talking about like these issues that we're talking about tonight and give people a way to facilitate and change how they're growing their systems. And after, after all of this, kind of started developing, I started realizing that the reason that all these soil trucks were coming out in the valley and filling pots and, and filling raised beds and scraping people's pads was because people didn't know any other way necessarily. Because this, because the cannabis industry started underground, indoors, hydroponically, and people were working with these systems that they knew how, how to work with. And when your livelihood um, depends on it. You don't really want to change your system. And so what I found was I found a lot of people were starting to be more and more open to these new ways of, which were actually old ways, of just growing in the ground. And we had to start developing systems that would be able to prove that you could get the same results. You could get the same cannabinoid profiles. You could get the same the same yields. And, and so that's something that I've been working on the last three or four years is using my expertise in farming for 20 years, growing vegetables and helping the cannabis community to figure out how they can do the same in the ground. Because as they see their, their costs start to go up and then their returns go down, they have to figure out how to, how to tighten their margins. And so that's, that's the main thing that I would say about the world of soil fertility and the food system um, and the interaction of it is that I, I am concerned about it in a certain respect, but in another respect, like I just see it as another leg of agriculture and I'm, I'm excited to see how it will, it will evolve over the coming years. And I'm okay with these rocky waters that we're in right now, because a lot of people there's, it's, it's interesting. Everybody I talked to before I came here tonight and once I got here, everybody was kind of not sure why we were all here you know like nobody really knew exactly what we were trying to drive home and that's okay you know i i think that's great and i i think that this should be a starting place for us to all be in one room and and ask questions and wonder what the hell's going on and how is this going to change the face of agriculture and how can this be another industry just like grapes or just like pears or just like vegetables um, and there are going to be problems along the way, and um, I, I feel like the best way to deal with that is to come, in, to come up with solutions. Um, and that's, that's honestly what I'm trying to do with my other enterprises that I've, I've created, is it's, it's not to figure out a way to like capitalize off of it. It's a way to continue the conversation with everybody and, and have it in this open format. So I know that's kind of a long, convoluted way to relate to soil fertility, but like, I just don't feel like we can get into stewarding our land unless we figure out the human aspect of it first. And so that's something that I'm most interested in right now. So that's pretty much all I've got. Okay. So just to, yeah, thank you for that, Chris. That was great. Um, and just to piggyback on that a little bit is the point about generalization is a really good point. And I think that's part of the issue we're dealing with here in this entire conversation is cannabis, agriculture, and, and as Chris said, they're, they're pretty much one thing. They're all happening in the same places. And uh, and uh, it, it is a mistake to to generalize that, that they're one thing. I, I think I've got my list of the, the questions that the organizers asked, but um, real quickly, you know, agriculture itself, when you generalize, you say agriculture, vineyards, this and that. And I think an important thing, oh, by the way, I'm here to talk about labor, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so one of the things when you talk about farming in general, you know, Chris is farming 40 acres. I'm currently farming about 150 acres. In the past, I've been farming up to 400 acres here in the valley. And, and so scale is, is critical when assessing labor. Um, Chris's traditional labor force might be a dozen interns through the summer, I'm looking at 20 to 60 folks, um, mostly from Mexico. Um, and, and as Chris said, we've had labor issues in, in farming in general for a while. You know, you've got small scale agriculture, um, intensive veggie production and other small scale producers tend to have fewer people. They tend to be 
college age, and here I am generalizing, but um, they tend to be, you know, college age folks doing internships, learning a craft, learning as apprentices or interns, and then moving on and about. And um, I'm dealing with a migrant or really a, a local but, but immigrant labor force. Um, and then as farms get bigger than the operations I'm running, you see uh, mechanization and then supplement it with, with some other typically again Mexican labor or, or immigrant labor. Um, so farming is an industry scale. Um, we've been facing labor issues since well before anything having to do with marijuana, well before anything having to do with, with current administration and for decades. It's farm labor has been, been hammered. Um, again, same reasons Chris said, you've got the, the work ethic of the, the up and coming generation of farm labor age folks in the country and you've got uh, restrictions on immigration but you also have what's going on in Mexico and, and I don't mean to generally say Mexicans you know we have we have folks from Guatemala but almost everyone who works with, with me is from Mexico so I'm using that term but um, really you've got global forces at play you've got um, in Mexico you have rising uh, rate of education and what you see with rising rate of education is decline in birth rate and so um, also in Mexico you have now a, a country that is a net farm labor importer and so we don't have the same available labor uh, from Mexico that we've we've had on the mid-scale um, and then circling over to to marijuana as an industry um, I think you've got multiple industries within that realm as well you've got rec um, which is new. Um, you've got medical, which has been around, um, and you've got bootleggers, um, and that's the folks who are growing, you know, solely for the black market. And then there's there's some some interplay between some of those. Um, but I think it's again, as Chris was saying, um, when you have the pressures tightening on on rec and their margins growing thinner because there's more marijuana available and labor's getting tighter and their expenses go up um, and you've got the medical folks who um, you know their market is limited theoretically um, what you'll what you'll see is the most robust and sort of sustainable realm is is in the bootleg but that's conjecture uh, I understand so real quick into my personal experience and then I'll address the questions that, that the organizers asked. Um, I went into this season thinking that I didn't have much of a labor problem. Um, Maude had asked me earlier on in the season about this talk and I said, well, I, I don't know if I'm the person to talk to because I don't think that much of the Mexican labor force that I'm working with is interested in working in marijuana. Um, I can generalize as to why that might be, but really it's it's been a little stigmatized in their culture. Um, a lot of them have questionable immigration status, and so they may not feel like working in an industry that they perceive to be less than above board. Um, and then you've got, you know, the history of where they've come from. Um, marijuana doesn't have a great rap in Mexico. So, but uh, this year I've started to see, and I've, I've heard from small scale veggie farmers, yeah, they've been losing folks out to cannabis for years. Um, this year I'm starting to finally see loss of supervisors, loss of um, farm labor hands, workers on the field, and and it's not a generalization or a guess as to where they're going because I'm being told they're going to go work in cannabis, uh, or as they call it, marijuana, but they're, they're going to work in marijuana because it pays. It pays so much more than we can afford to. And I'm a contractor, so I don't actually pay out of pocket. But I still can't justify to my clients, hey, I need to pay people 20 bucks an hour. But that's the going rate, as, as I'm told, for marijuana production is 20 bucks an hour for field labor. And that is that is what it is. That's what we're dealing with. And um, it really does, in my opinion, raise a question of, of equitable wages for farm labor. Uh, you know, are they setting a bar? Uh, that we all need to rise to? If we're in other ag sectors, do we need to figure out how to be able to pay competitive wage? Or is this an artificial standard? And I don't have an answer to that. That's one of my questions. Um, but I do know that farms need long-term labor to create equitable situations. And I am concerned that some farms won't make it through this 
this bubble. But um, to address the the questions that the organizers pose to us here, uh, how and where do food system and cannabis industry intersect? Land, water, labor, all the things we're here talking about. Um, and farm service industries, uh, so any contractors who are doing irrigation, running heavy equipment, trucking, um, any farm supply resources, there is equal demand, if not outpaced demand, and, and again, in the same way you have labor um, being influenced by the available dollars in cannabis, you have these other resources being influenced. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get a trucker to come out, and I've heard, I'm friends with a lot of contractors, and they joke with me what they charge the marijuana guys, um, because they can, you know? So describe changes you have seen to the food system in recent years related to cannabis industry. Well, land prices have gone up dramatically. Um, labor has become more difficult to secure. I was talking to the extension agent today and he's like, yeah, other guys are asking me, can I get, you know, can I hire some of your lab interns to come do field work for me? Um, they're just having a hard time nailing down folks. Um, and it's not, again, it's, this isn't, I'm guessing that it's going to cannabis. We're being told, like, I'm gonna go work trimming reefer or, or, or setting up trellis in cannabis farms or do, laying out you know, plastic in the big hemp fields. So it's, it's a real competition there. Um, challenges I see the cannabis industry presenting to the food system, increased pressure on labor and other resources. Um, we have to figure out how to motivate folks to grow food when, <laughs> when there's an easy way to uh, make more money growing marijuana. Um, what opportunities do you see the cannabis industry affording the food system? Well, there's certainly a wealthier local market um, because as profits are high right now, um, folks are able to afford more expensive local produce. And I don't know, one of my questions is, is that a net gain for the food system? Uh, if you've got wealthy clients around, well, that might be good. That might help you raise your labor. Um, so a guess at a solution, um, just to wrap up here, how am I doing on time? Okay, a guess at a solution. I have the same solution for everything, um, which is spend money where you where you want to see it grow. So if you if you're into supporting family farms, spend money at the farmers market. Spend money where the family farmers, the local farmers, are selling their produce, and that's that's pretty much the best thing you can do if you want to see the farms weather the storm. Okay. If you have finished writing down your question, please go ahead and raise your hand and Stu or Megan will come and collect them. Thank you. And this is Josh on land use planning. I'm Josh. So uh, my department, Department of Land Conservation and Development, administers the statewide planning program for the state of Oregon. We, uh, statewide planning has been in effect for 44 years now, since 1973. Uh, we have a foundation of 19 statewide planning goals, um, 14 of which apply to Southern Oregon. And the, the intersection of uh, food system, cannabis industry, and land use really comes down to a couple of the goals, but primarily goal three, which is agricultural lands. So our, our goal for agricultural lands is essentially to preserve and maintain agricultural lands for agricultural production. So it says, uh, they shall be preserved and maintained for farm use, consistent with existing and future needs for agricultural products, forest, and open space, and with the state's agricultural land use policies. Um, so in regards to cannabis, uh, this came from the legislature, so it's, an, an, uh, it's in revised statute. Senate Bill 1598 specifically called cannabis uh, or ma marijuana a crop for the purposes of farm use. So essentially in doing so what it did was put cannabis into the same category as all the other agricultural commodities that we see in the state of Oregon. So that's an important thing um, as we discuss this, that's not something that we can change. Um, well, that's something the legislature could change potentially, but as far as staying out of policy, that's not something that we can change at the moment. So it's a matter of working with that existing framework and that existing definition. The, the Senate bill also established um, that, or allowed that jurisdictions, sorry, sorry. 
<laughs> it also is. Uh, it also prohibited or also allowed for reasonable re reasonable regulations to be established by jurisdictions. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. So uh, counties are doing this, and cities are doing this quite differently across the state. Uh, in southern Oregon, um, well, the, across the state, the things that uh, that counties have considered to be reasonable regulations are things such as setbacks, noise, things that address odor, water use, lighting, um, canopy size, waste management. So that's something that counties have taken different approaches with across the state. Um, down here. Primarily, we're talking about Josephine and Jackson counties. Jackson County adopted um, what they consider to be reasonable regulations a while ago. Was it a year, year and a half ago? Josephine County has still not done that yet. Um, so Jackson County, for instance, um, took into consideration something else. And one of the things that they thought about was whether they wanted to allow cannabis growing on rural residential land. So because the legislature termed uh, uh, marijuana a farm use. It's allowed outright where any farm use is allowed. In rural residential land, the primary use of rural residential land is really for residential. Um, and then there's secondary uses like farming, agriculture, things like that. Um, so it's to a large degree up to the counties to decide how they want to permit that or whether they want to permit that. They could allow it outright. They could allow it with certain specific conditions like additional setbacks, decreasing canopy size. Um, Jackson County decided to not allow grows on rec commercial recreation grows on rural residential land. So far Josephine County hasn't made a decision on that. They did put out a, a referendum on the ballot which suggested that the community supports prohibiting it on rural residential land but they haven't acted on that yet. So the, we were asked, you know, what are the challenges and opportunities? So I'm gonna start with the challenges and move on to the opportunities. I'd like to end on a, a good note. So we've seen, we've, I've heard a lot of um, concerns from citizens across both counties, primarily Josephine County. Um, and these aren't, this isn't an exhaustive list. These are just some of the things I hear quite a bit about. The first thing is about greenhouses. And in particular, I think what people are concerned about is kind of how they term it to be like the industrialization of, of agriculture. They're seeing a lot of indoor grows happening. And I think, you know, we, we some of you, you uh, the previous panelists spoke about that as to why that might be the case. Um, but we're, we're seeing with that a lot of community impacts because primarily because of noise with greenhouse fans. Um, we're hearing concerns about the compaction of soils and essentially at least uh, from a perception standpoint, that loss of those so those soils um, indefinitely because of the compaction and the you know and paving over over those soils. Um, one, one of the main things that I like to emphasize, and I think we all know it intuitively, um, that we have a high concentration of producers in Jackson and Josephine County. In fact, in the two counties alone, we make up a third of the OLCC permitted uh, grows. So, you know, we don't make up anywhere near a third of the population or a third of the size of the state. We have a third of the grows, though. So it's, it, it's something that, you know, if you think about it that way, it's like, if they were dispersed a lot more, if we had a lot less of them, we'd probably have a lot fewer problems, but that's not the case here because we have a particular climate that's hospitable to growing cannabis. Uh, and then uh, what was touched on earlier is uh, the price of land, especially price of land with irrigation rights. In Jackson County, it's EFU land because it's not allowed, cannabis growing is not allowed on rural residential land, so we're seeing it. Uh, definitely an increase in land values on EFU land that has irrigation rights. And in Josephine County, because it is still allowed on rural residential land, we're seeing an increase on both rural residential and EFU land. Ma, can you go to the next one? So this, this is just a snapshot from Zillow. Um, about the increase, I don't know if you guys can see that, sorry if you can't, but it's basically showing the year-to-year -year increase on um, sales, home sale prices. 
and this this includes properties with that are vacant and properties with homes but what I wanted to point out was you know you look at say Williams they've seen a and Wolf Creek it looks like they're the same they've seen a 24 percent increase year-to-year -year increase in um, in prices so the median home price right now in Williams is three hundred and two thousand dollars isn't that interesting? <laughs> so this, I think, easily illustrates, and I did the same thing with Jackson County, but it was, there are too many cities to talk about, and it's a little bit more complicated in Jackson County. We have, there's some different dynamics here. But I think this points out the fact that, that the price of land is going up, and that's affecting everybody, including those who want to purchase land to grow things other than cannabis. So what kind, what kind of opportunities are there? Well, from a land use standpoint, one of the opportunities, I guess positive benefits that I see is that up until cannabis um, became as prevalent as it is in the legal form that it is, um, we, our department and the local jurisdictions were getting a lot of requests to convert farmland to residential use. What they what would often be said is, you know, we can't grow anything on this property, why shouldn't we be able to get the highest and best use of the property, which often translated in, into residential use. Um, there's, there, I'll wait for that. So, you know, we, we have some philosophical issues and some statewide planning goals that really try to minimize uh, residential development on rural lands and in, in, in urban sprawl. So um, to a certain degree, the, the cannabis industry has taken some of the heat off of the conversion of land because it is a, an agricultural commodity. And what we're seeing is a lot more interest in purchasing land assuming that it has irrigation rights to grow cannabis on. And oftentimes, because they are often bringing their own soil in, they are not as concerned about the soil quality. So the ideal circumstance, I think, would be for, for properties that don't have high quality soil but have irrigation rights to be able to um, get as many of the cannabis grows that we can on those pieces of property because um, one of the, the um, things that I didn't list on that other list was the fact that we're seeing, in addition to the greenhouses and the compaction of soils, what we're seeing a lot of is prime farmland being purchased, not necessarily for the actual soil capabilities, but because it's land with irrigation rights. And we know that that type of land's in very short supply in this area, and to the extent possible, if we can try to get the, you know, the cannabis grows onto soils and property that aren't as suitable, I think we can, we should try to do that to the extent we, we can. The last, the last thing, and I don't know if Daniel, you pointed this out, I didn't quite hear, but you know, what, what we often hear is, um, you know, obviously the, the age of farmers is, is continuing to go up. We're trying to encourage younger farmers to get into it. We've got obviously some conflicting things with the cost of land going up. One of, the, one of the opportunities though here is for farmers that farm things other than cannabis to use cannabis as a supplemental income for them. And I also wanted to take the opportunity to point out, this is not 2015 data, but this is Oregon's top 20 commodities. The, the commodity I highlighted, greenhouse and nursery, it's the number two commodity in the state of Oregon and I think it's been number one in the, in the past as well. So I, I point that out because I've talked to the Department of, our representative for the Department of Agriculture recently about this issue, trying to prepare for this. And what he said is really cannabis growing in the greenhouses that we're seeing and the, the proliferation of greenhouses and indoor growth isn't very dissimilar isn't very dissimilar to the greenhouses and of the nursery stock and things that we see up in the Willamette. So it's just something that's of interest, in, you know, and I'm not giving any opinion here, but it is, that is the second, the second top commodity in the state of Oregon. So that's all I have. You can go to my happy slide now. Can you go to the happy slide? There we go. My name's Megan Lanier and I'm with Lanier Land Consulting. I'm a land use consultant and a planner here in the valley and I have been for about 15 years. Um, really a lot of my experience 
in, in going over some of the questions that they posed to us is a lot of what I hear on both sides of the community. Uh, we've been predominantly, prior to the cannabis industry, all I did was, uh, was regular land use. We would do vineyards, we'd help people get um, uh, dwellings established in conjunction with farm use and what we've seen now with the cannabis industry is a lot of um, my land use experience is now going in that direction just because there's a big demand for it. We have a um, like I said before, a lot of what I what I get out of the different communities and trying to compare the traditional uh, farming practices, if you will, to commit to the cannabis industry is that they have a lot of um, similarities, but there are a lot of challenges. And going to the questions here, let me just get to them really quickly. I apologize, I'm going to have to look up here. Um, how and where do the food systems and cannabis industries inter intersect? And one of the things that I've seen in my experience has been that the, they intersect and a lot of things have been actually mentioned so far. So water is a big one that we were, were encountering. Um, I've encountered uh, also land values. A lot of people come to me in trying to purchase land to make sure it's the right land for whatever their project is. And we've seen a, just an, an enormous increase in cost of um, housing, vacant land, especially land that has irrigation rights. Uh, but a big, a big part of it, of the, um, how they also connect is really just with and with labor. I think all of these things have actually been mentioned this evening. Describing the challenge, the changes I've seen in the food system in recent years related to the cannabis industry. A lot of this is a lot of the changes that I have seen is a, is uh, the use of land not being. And I think Siobhan had some very good slides showing how you have an entire field being farmed, and now you'll have like a one acre. 40,000 square foot production site. And one of the things that I've seen become an issue for some of my clients who are actually leasing land to cannabis um, people are they'll have 35 acres of irrigated land, one acre is getting irrigated, and what a lot of people don't understand is if you don't use those irrigation rights, they, will, they can go away. So there's become a little bit more of a concern about that and how we should be able to, you know, is there a way that we could possibly coexist that gets to into some of the opportunity situation at the end there, but I think a big part of it is um, making sure that we have those, that we can try to preserve those water rights for people for the future, because cannabis, you know, maybe this, this pers particular person isn't going to be successful in what they try to do, and the next thing you know, we're resorting back to grass hay or we're resorting back to some sort of other farm use traditional type of farm use. Um, some of their challenges is acquisition of land, kind of goes back to that too, their inability to acquire it, acquire it, the traditional farmer, just because they don't have the income that the, a lot of the cannabis industry does. Um, so it's getting harder for them to lease land, it's getting, or it's more expensive for them to lease land, it's more expensive for them to purchase land, and that's kind of become a, bit, a pretty big problem, at least I've, in, I've experienced. Um, Challenges that we see the cannabis industry presenting to the food system. Some of the, really my only experience in this has been um, in talking with some of my other clients who have, I have a, um, a client who owns an orchard and they've explained to me that their biggest concern was labor. It was already becoming a little bit of an issue like that was stated before um, and they're actually finding that it's a lot harder now. That was one of the the um, challenges that they've that they've come into. But again, the irrigation is a big issue too. That's another challenge that we're considering is not losing those irrigation rights on these large parcels of land, and being able to make sure that people are using their water rights appropriately. Because a lot of people think, oh, I've got water rights off this creek, and what they don't understand is that if the water rights were done correctly, they would have been mapped in a certain areas to where those can be used, and a lot of people are not using them in those areas. So there's another. Another challenge that we've seen um, is people not using their irrigation properly. Um, in terms of opportunities to see the cannabis industry affording the food system network, I really think that it, one of the things that I would like to see, um, just because I've represented both sides of the industry, is, is a coming of them together to be able to utilize all of the land so that we're not having a 30 acre, 100 acre parcel of land sitting 
fallow for the most part with the exception of wherever the grow area is or the greenhouses are going to be because I mean even general I think even the largest I've seen has been anywhere from three to four acres and it's just because it's very well spread out but it would be really nice to see the rest of that land um, utilized and um, for us to be able to preserve the irrigation rights one of the challenges that I've heard from some of my other cannabis clients is is their concern of what's being sprayed on some of those other farms because whatever there's a very very um, restrictive amount of things that can actually be sprayed on cannabis so if you have a neighbor who hey let's share this land but they're they're growing <laughs> since we love every 10 minutes that's happening <laughs> um, so the big challenge that I think that we, the cannabis industry has said to me is that there is, is what are they spraying on it? There could be spray drift, especially if you have an outdoor grow. Indoor grows can be a little bit more controlled, but still there's concern with that as, as well. So though that might be an opportunity, I think there's going to have to be a lot of um, communication agreements, and I really would love to see that go that way. The other option is, is what Josh mentioned too, is actually doing multiple grow sites on one parcel so that you can actually maximize the amount of land being used and also maximize the amount of water and make sure you can preserve those water rights. Um, I do believe that it has created a lot of opportunities. A lot of my cannabis clients do um, very much support the local economy. Going to farmer's markets, it's something that is actually very, um, something that I've seen is actually being very encouraging. One of the, um, a lot, what I'm also seeing as an opportunity to is that a lot of the cannabis farmers actually taking on the opportunity to actually do other types of farming on their land because they now have control over what's being sprayed on them or what they can do with it. And they're trying to expand into other areas so that we can hopefully utilize some of that land. But, so from a land use perspective, um, it's kind of a, having these two crossovers a little bit interesting we're dealing with both um, the cannabis industry and then our and then our traditional farming practices and I think there's gonna have to be a lot of conversations and I think this is a really good symposium to have and to be able to keep the communication open I think that's the best way that we're gonna be able to survive in the future well, yeah. My name is Michael Johnson. Um, I'm the Chief of Operations for Siskiyou Sungrown. We're a recreational cannabis producer. Um, we're out in Williams. We've got a single tier two recreational farm. Um, it encompasses about two and a half acres of land. Um, that's about 2,500 plants. Um, we've also got an Oregon Department of Agriculture licensed hemp field uh, next door on a separate parcel. So I've been in the cannabis industry for about 10 years. Um, before I entered the cannabis industry, I worked as a food farmer. Um, when I graduated high school, I realized I wanted to come farm, period. And that led me into the, the woofing program, Willing Workers on Organic Farms, and that's how I began. So uh, food production, especially organic food production, is really dear to my heart and something I care a lot about. Um, when I entered the, the cannabis industry here in Oregon, um, I started as a medical marijuana patient and a small-time medical marijuana grower. Um, as a lot of you know, Cannabis production here in Southern Oregon is not new. Um, it's been going on for a long time. Um, primarily, it's been happening in parcels that are not your typical ag parcels. Uh, people have had to hide for the most part, and so they haven't been out in the flats in the prime ag land, and they haven't been using agricultural water rights for the most part. So they brought me here to talk about regulation, and when I consider regulation and, and what it's doing to both the cannabis industry and the food systems, um, to me the primary benefit that I see is it's bringing cannabis into its rightful place as an agricultural crop and bringing it out of the shadows because it, it truly is an agricultural crop. And rather than using domestic wells and being on residential parcels and up in the hills, it now gets to uh, come onto the ag land, use water that's designated to be an agricultural crop and um, you know to start bringing revenue and uh, revenue into the community as well as taxes uh, to the community so you know as we leave the black market and the the medical industry which is starting to go away um, the recreational industry I think provides a lot of opportunities um, I've seen 
a lot more uh, money coming in that's available for food farmers. You know, when I go to the farmer's market, I can see the cannabis farmers spending their money on food, which I think is a good thing. Um, I think economic vitality is something that directly supports the food system. Um, I think uh, in general, you know, I, I used to work for uh, Barking Moon Farm. Uh, Melissa's here tonight. Um, they were my first uh, uh, farming gig in Southern Oregon. And one thing I got to see with their farm is, you know, the trouble with labor. And many people have mentioned it here. It's it, it can be slightly redundant, but one of the bigger problems I do see for the food industry is uh, the lack of labor um, because cannabis farms are able to pay a, a higher wage. Um, that's something that I don't have an easy answer for. Um, however, I see higher minimum wages for working class people as a benefit to our region in general. And I think, uh, you know, lower wage employees uh, getting more money is only going to help our community in a, in a variety of ways. They're going to be able to uh, eat healthier, they're going to be able to support their families better, uh, they're going to be less dependent in general. And so I see the money coming in from cannabis as kind of a, a tide that can lift all boats. Um, I guess, you know, in closing, um, I want to share one example, which is from our farm. You know, the, the farm that we purchased for Siskiyou Sun Grown, it wasn't previously a food farm that we then converted into cannabis. It was a hay farm. And any of you who know about uh, hay farming, it uses an incredible amount of water. Um, it doesn't provide many jobs and it doesn't provide much revenue in general to the person who owns the field. And so uh, the folks we bought the field from, uh, it was a five acre parcel. Um, they told us they used 50,000 gallons of water a day through the dry season to flood irrigate the field. Um, and the net revenue they were able to bring in was less than $10,000 over the entire season. And they had no jobs created. Um, it was one gentleman who worked the field. We've turned that five acre field into uh, 20 full time jobs, um, over a million dollars in annual revenue, and we use a fraction of the water that they were using previously. So I think there's a, there's a new model here that's being set forward. Um, all cannabis farmers are not alike. Um, they've talked about the greenhouse complexes, the paving over of, of prime farmland, um, degradation of rural residential communities with light pollution, noise pollution, etc. We're trying to provide an example of a way to do large-scale cannabis farming where you don't engage in those activities, um, where you plant directly in the soil, um, use the prime ag soils. We don't truck in mountains of potting soil. We don't have noisy fans. We don't have high-powered lights. Uh, our farm looks a lot like a vineyard. And so, um, as Chris Jagger mentioned uh, in his speech, this is a nuanced conversation. And so, it's important not to to generalize, but to really understand that there's a lot of different things here, there's a lot of different moving parts, and um, if we can encourage the right types of production and, and the good actors, um, there's a lot of opportunity here, and the synergy between cannabis farming and food farming, um, I think, provides just a, a really great thing for Southern Oregon. So, thank you. Okay, I think this question is going to be for Daniel or Chris, and it it's in regards to labor. So what compensation can the average field hand for food production expect? Wage, hourly, annual, benefits, insurance, and what effect does this have on the attractiveness of farming to the younger generation? I'd say mid-scale, brand new, um, 12, 1250, uh, with skills, 14, 15. Um, and then, you know, depending on your legal status, your eligibility for benefits, you know, varies. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, you're talking grapes, right? I'm talking grapes and pears, yeah. Yeah, so that's something that I think is interesting to take note of here is that I've always had that challenge too, is like, I've wanted workers and it's, I've said, well, why not go to the vineyard workers, you know, but I couldn't afford to pay them that for a long time. So it's kind of a, a similar story. Um, but we, we start everybody out at $12 an hour now. Um, benefits, uh, food, produce. Um, I 
I'm looking forward to the day that we could afford uh, other benefits and healthcare, but the margins just aren't there. So, um, and with the increased uh, um, minimum wage going up, um, it's a question. I mean, I want to pay, I want to pay everybody a living wage, but if the margins aren't there, then I just I'm challenged challenged to be able to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, the price of produce of vegetables hasn't really changed much since the 70s. <laughs> think about that for a minute, you know? I mean, I don't know if that really has anything to do with the cannabis industry or not. I think it just is that we don't put a lot of value on our food. So, um, yeah. Just a quick quick follow-up is a uh, company I was with before where I'm at now, which was a family farm. They were in the 14 to 15 for folks who had been there for years. Um, and some foremen are making 20 bucks an hour, 22 bucks an hour. Uh, one, one last thing that I would mention is what effect does this have on the attractiveness of uh, farming to the younger generation? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that there is a lot of attractive anymore. And I don't, and that's not me being cynical either. That's just being honest, you know? Um, uh, organic farming was really groovy and really cool for quite a while and then I think we kind of ran the gamut and a lot of people realized how hard it really is it's hard you know that's what it takes to produce food and so you know are the robot overlords gonna take over maybe I mean you know I, I mechanize as much as I can I have to so yeah to to that very point not to keep going back and forth here but to that very point um, the attractiveness not only labor, but if you're if you are a young person here with agricultural ambitions, you want to start a farm. There are a lot of disincentives because I can go buy a farm back east for a tenth of what I can buy a farm here for. Thank you both. Um, this question began to be answered a minute ago. I think it would be worth revisiting, and I, I suspect Siobhan, you're going to have the best answer here. Uh, although others could jump in. The question is posed as this. Since the footprint of cannabis irrigation is smaller, are water rights subject to forfeiture? Who is monitoring? And then the follow-up question, who is regulating agricultural wells? Stand close to the mic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People are welcome to move up. There's empty seats here, and then you definitely hear our panelists. So yes, um, generally the footprint for a cannabis grow is much smaller than the historic footprint of possibly the prior act crop that was there and most likely the footprint of the water right. Um, there's many options for landowners to either lease a portion of their water right that they're not using in stream, so therefore it's protected and has its beneficial use. Um, that's a benefit for everybody. Um, another option for those water rights is that they can transfer them to another parcel or some other person downstream to, to use. Um, and the, the portion of the question is who's monitoring it? Um, it's kind of an honor system um, just because, yes, yes, it is comical. Um, <laughs> Um, so if a water right is not used for five consecutive years, um, it's subject to cancellation. Um, my agency isn't in the realm of going out and finding water rights to cancel because we like it when people are able to use their land to their best abilities. Um, usually when a cancellation comes into play is if a parcel hasn't been used for um, their water rights for an extended period of time and a new land landowner comes in and so that it, that new use or that resurrecting that new use affects a water user downstream, then usually that's when the, um, the cancellation comes into play. And it's specifically a landowner um, process to go through. Oh, wait, no, we're not taking questions that way. You need to write it down. Yeah. Oh. oh, yes, yes, the domestic wells. And where's the question? Oh. What was the question about? Do you uh, have questions about? Oh, um, uh, who regulates agricultural wells? And so, my thought on agricultural wells would be a well that has a water right for agricultural purposes. And so, once again, it's a, in the honor system. 
um, so that if there is a water right, generally, um, you know, it's, a, it's up to the landowner to kind of monitor themselves. Um, I'll go out once in a while and, you know, kind of verify that, you know, parcels that are using water are, that have the proper water right and they're applying it to the lands that they're supposed to be applied to. Um, any newer water right or change to a new water right or an old water right um, will require a measurement device criteria. And so that's a method that a um, an agricultural well or a water right can be monitored because there's going to be specific criteria for measurement and reporting associated with that water right. So while you're here, oh. got another water question. So the question is, are canals not federally regulated and is there a conflict in using federally regulated water on a federally illegal crop? I'll leave you here. Ah. That's a great series of questions. Um, are canals federally regulated? Um, it, it, it depends. Um, if it's federal water going through the canal, it can be federally regulated. If it's, if it's the proper size, then the canal can be under the jurisdiction of the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, there's many canals and levees in the Klamath Basin that are regulated by, um, by the feds. Um, so the second question is, is there a conflict in using federal regulated water on a federally illegal crop? Um, from what I understand, um, the, the federal government is not allowing the use of federal water for cannabis cultivation. Um, where that comes into play is um, two examples are water that's stored in Lost Creek Reservoir and Applegate Reservoir. Um, those, both of those storage facilities are operated and maintained by the federal government. Um, but landowners who live downstream of those facilities can enter into contract with the federal government for them to release water down either the Applegate or the Rogue River for those individuals to pick them up however they can convey it to their property. Um, part of that contract is identifying what you're going to grow. And from what I understand, the federal government is not entering into contract for anybody who's um, using that water to grow um, cannabis. So it's a federal requirement. Um, although my agency is the agency that issues water rights, we don't um, regulate the federal government's discretion on which type of crop they would like to deliver water to. <clears throat> All right, as I ask the question, Michael, why don't you start coming up? This is going to be for you. <laughs> Uh, I think a pretty easy one for you. Um, is there a limit on how large a cannabis plantation can be on, on, on EFU land? And if there is a limit, who is enforcing it? <laughs> yes, so there are limits. Um, it depends on what style of production you're doing, uh, whether you're doing indoor or greenhouse or strictly outdoor. Um, but for an outdoor farm, uh, the limit is 40,000 square feet of canopy. So they regulate the amount of, of canopy that you're growing of mature plants. Uh, that would be flowering plants. And so you can choose to spread out your 40,000 square feet of canopy over a larger area. Um, 40,000 square feet is just under an acre. I think an acre is around 43,000 square feet. And so our farm, for example, spreads out that 40,000 square feet over two and a half acres. Um, so you're allowed to do that. Um, but as far as who's regulating that, that's the Oregon Liquor Control Commission is in charge of recreational cannabis. Um, they come out um, and, and check out your canopy designation before you're ever allowed to begin. And then they do come out and do random inspections and annual planned inspections. And so, um, you would be foolish to go outside of that. You would jeopardize your licensure. Okay, I think this one would be for Josh, so if you want to come up. Um, so Jackson County decided to allow cannabis cultivation on resource lands only. Given some of the conflicts discussed here tonight, is it possible to revisit the zoning requirement? Yes. <laughs> so I'm assuming what this is asking is whether Jackson County could revisit it and allow on rural residential land. Is that right, whoever asked this? 
So, so to so to go back and, and take it away from from resource districts or to allow in rural residential land, I think is the question. That that's fine. I can answer both of them. So, um, Jackson County, as far as I understand it, wouldn't have the ability to retract and and disallow cannabis production on land where farm use isn't allowed outright permitted use. So that's that would be EFU land. That would be their their forest land, so their woodland, woodland, woodland resource zones. The other side of that is rural residential. They decided to prohibit it outright on rural residential lands. Josephine County, like I said, hasn't made a decision yet, but other communities have made decisions. Um, some of them, some counties have allowed them, but with more restrictions. So minimum lot sizes, they, they say you can't do cannabis grows, recreational cannabis grows on rural residential land that's under five acres or under 10 acres, or you need a 100 foot setback from you know your property line or a neighbor or something like that. So there's, there's the ability for Jackson County to go back and allow it on the rural residential land if they would choose to, um, but they didn't. Um, Jackson County has currently um, had an opportunity where some hearings officers have made some decisions regarding production sites on our, our zone lands. You can actually do it if you were doing it legitimately and legally prior to, but only for medical purposes. So you would have to go through a non-conforming use application and whereas they were not actually approving those before, they have actually had some new case law established to where they are, are approving them now. All right, so this question was addressed to me, but I'd love to hear how others answer it. So I'll take a stab at it and then uh, we'll see how I folks want to respond. Uh, it's a rather complex question, so I'll pose it the way it was written here, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. It says, when, mar when marijuana growing became prevalent in the Illinois Valley, a friend said, quote, it's going to be interesting to see how much pot we can eat, end quote. <laughs> how do you see the transition to cannabis affecting the percent of local food grown for consumption by local people? Do you think we'll, we will see an overall decline in regional self-sufficiency in food production? So I'll take a stab at that. So that, that is what I do research on right now. Uh, I, I look at food security and food insecurity in the region and uh, ask questions about how we're doing in that regard. Um, one of the things that we found over the course of studying uh, how food is produced in our region is that we, are, we actually are more uh, food secure than most communities are uh, and far less food secure than most of you probably imagine. Uh, so when I say that we are more food secure than most communities, that it's sort of a, a goal for large communities in the United States today to be 2% food secure by 2020. So that has to say they produce 2% of their food. Uh, in our valley, it looks likely based on uh, our estimates and models that we are producing somewhere between 6 and 10% of our food in our valley at the present time. So the question is, how would cannabis production change that? Uh, I don't know the answer, but here's what I know, which is that largely what is controlling us not doing better is not us not growing it. It is not buying it. So it, it is the market, uh, the market that's the, that's the holding point here. So uh, if we were somehow able to incentivize individuals to buy local food or local cannabis, then we would, we would accomplish uh, what's being asked here. Um, now whether individuals feel, and this is possible, I actually think this is an opportunity, whether individuals begin to feel like um, buying local cannabis products is a way to support the local economy and become more interested in buying local generally, uh, then I think food producers and cannabis producers both win in, in that regard. Um, on the flip side, as a potential negative, which is, it was not posed directly in this question, is uh, there is also a potential for uh, for local lands to be purchased by non-local companies in either food or cannabis, in which case individuals who are buying local food might not be lo supporting local businesses. So with what I had to say, I'd love to hear how others would respond to this question. It's multifaceted. The panelists, you wanna, you wanna take a shot? Come on up. No offense to the person who asked the question, but this plays right into the generalization that Chris warned against and that I was warning against is saying, oh, is cannabis going to impact, 
you know, local food. It's, let me see, is this the question here? Oh, here. An overall decline in regional self-sufficiency in food production. The, the factors that are impacting that are way bigger than cannabis. That's, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. And some of those factors, well, yeah, there are many factors, and, and a number of those factors play themselves out um, in the, the farm bill uh, and the way that Oregon benefits, or, or in this case, fails to benefit from that bill. So uh, what we do in Oregon, uh, in large measure, what we, Josh put up there is our top 20 crops don't necessarily get the same kind of incentives that other things do. So we don't always benefit the same way others do. Okay. Ma, do you want to ask a question? Um, I'm not sure. Michael, you might want to take this, or Chris, or maybe Siobhan. Um, can you detail in comparison the amount of water used by hay farmers, veggie farmers, vineyards, and cannabis? Does cannabis use more water than other these other ag products? And that was, someone referred to that, but. All right, um, so part of the water right process is kind of figuring out how much water is required for irrigation. And so um, in the road basin, um, determined by the basin plan to for um, the area, this was created in, I think, in 1964, um, it was determined that um, in order to adequately irrigate one acre of land, you needed a total volume of water so that would equal four and a half acre feet of water. So imagine one acre of land, four feet deep of water. That was determined how much water was needed for um, irrigation. And I, and I believe that was directly related to um, um, growing hay. And so what is the rate or um, the instantaneous rate required to irrigate up to 80 acres is one cubic foot per second, which is roughly 444 gallons per minute. Um, if we would use that model to compare other crop types, for example, cannabis, um, you could probably grow a lot of cannabis on 80 acres and use a lot less than 449 gallons per minute. So, I mean, hopefully that helps answer that question. I'm going to jump into that question a little bit too. So, um, this was mentioned a couple of times already, but one of the things that I answer a lot to is uh, I work at I'm the chair of an environmental science department at Southern Oregon University, and I'm asked a lot about uh, what role agriculture plays in our, our water issues in the region. And so people say often, well, agriculture accounts for the vast majority of water use. Shouldn't we stop producing um, on agricultural lands? Um, there's two problems there, one we'd like to eat. And um, the other is that it, it's, it's addressing agriculture as one body. Um, so flood irrigating hay and drip irrigating tomatoes are very different uh, water strategies. And so uh, it's the same way across the board, regardless of the agricultural crop. It depends on how you're watering it and who's choosing to use the water and what way they're using it. So it's certainly a big difference. The, the question I was given to ask is the one that was just answered. And so I'm going to take this opportunity to ask a question of our panelists that is on my mind. Uh, so for the last three or four months, we've been holding uh, meetings with stakeholders and asking questions about what's what they see as a challenge in the food industry or the cannabis industry? What do they see as challenges? How can we um, how can we resolve those challenges? How can groups resolve them? And overwhelmingly, one of the things that's come up over and over again is uh, what kind of concerns do you have in your industry, regardless of what your industry is, uh, around outside interests moving into Southern Oregon? Whether that be cannabis producers, food producers, or individuals perhaps who are interested in a large-scale development. So I'm curious uh, how others feel about that, and um, perhaps is there an answer to individuals feeling really good about the place that we call home? Really, you want to bring that up? That's <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's terrifying. Come on, Chris. Come on out. All right, I'll answer it. Oh, man, I don't know how I feel about this. Um, well, 
Um, we live in a free market economy. <laughs> I don't necessarily want to see corporate interests come in and destroy what I have. So I continue to build my relationship with my customers and my community, and I hope for the best. That's kind of, I, I think that's the best answer I can give without getting into like hour, hours long debate about what I'm doing. Um, I just know that as I continue my craft and continue to do better and build that relationship and I mean use use the internet and social media to, to strengthen my presence and be hopeful, I guess. I mean, that's not the answer to it all though because yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about it and I'm not even concerned about large cannabis farms coming in. You know, there've been talks for years about large uh, corporate vegetable farms coming in as land values and when we saw the drought in California happening, um, there was a lot of farms that were looking to come up here in Klamath Falls area um, and there are berry farms that were bought up in the Willamette that are out of the area. Um, what does that mean for our food system, you know? Um, it's it's a really, it's, it's something that I think that we all need to keep the conversation open and I think that um, it's really important to just keep keep our relationships uh, um, strong among others, you know? I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure how else to, to add to that, so. So to answer that question in regards to cannabis here in Oregon, um, it's definitely something that's concerning to me personally and to a lot of people who've been invested in the Oregon cannabis industry for many years, even prior to recreational. Um, when cannabis was legalized here in Oregon, um, they formed a committee in the legislature and in the initial drafts of the rules they had, there were residency requirements that were put in. And we were very hopeful uh, hearing those discussed by the legislature that you'd have to be a resident of Oregon for, some of them said two years, some of them said four years, but it ensured that you had to have been here prior to recreational cannabis to be able to participate in this. And we were very hopeful, unfortunately, uh, lobbying interests uh, got that removed. And so now that there is no residency requirement, um, we are seeing large corporations um, from out of state and even from out of the country coming in and buying large tracts of land in the Applegate and in Williams where we live. And it's frightening um, because they're far more capitalized than we are. Um, your average Oregonian cannabis farmer is a mom and pop organization trying to stay alive and to see large corporations with millions, sometimes tens, hundreds of millions of dollars coming in. Um, I've heard from some of these individuals and you know they have an extermination program in mind. They'd like to get rid of the mom and pop cannabis farmers and they have a model to uh, basically sustain losses for years while the mom and pops are bled dry. And so it is a concerning development. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about it now. Um, it goes back to you know voting with your dollar. And if you are concerned about it, uh, supporting local farmers, both food farmers and local cannabis farmers. And that's the best we could do. So corporate interest coming in is, is a very, very common phenomenon in, in vineyards. Um, where it happens all over the, the world, uh, an industry gets established and then next thing you know, the big guys from Napa or from wherever come in. And what we see, so we can all imagine the impacts, it's just gonna exacerbate the exact same stresses we're already under, increase those same stresses. Um, so with vineyards, you know, land here may have gone up in price, but it's still 25% of what it is in Napa and Sonoma. Uh, and their land prices are going up. We will see corporate investment here especially in vineyard land and as, as orchards phase out. Uh, no offense to any orchardists. Um, I guess one of the, the strategies to deal with that is to, if you have the ability to, become a producer yourself. Uh, if, because what we see are two types of, of takeovers. There's um, people who come in and buy large tracts of land and, and plant vineyards and, or whatever um, and begin producing as direct competition, but there are also people who come in, and this is a new phenomenon we're seeing here. You know, most of the grapes grown in the valley here are going to Willamette Valley, uh, probably 80, 90 percent. Um, so we're already exporting to other interests uh, a lot of our crop, in, in vineyards especially, in pears, you know, how many pears leave the valley, almost all of them. Uh, so I guess my point is, what we're seeing 
more and more of recently though are people who have small holdings um, planting vineyards and just supplying larger houses uh, and so it does keep the majority of that labor and that economic stimulus as local dollars versus the corporations basically become our customers and so if you have the power to, to affect things that way I'd encourage anyone in this room to consider contracting with those folks to keep them from owning your land. Um, so this question is why aren't vineyards facing similar complaints as cannabis? Because vineyard economics are a fairy tale. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, the people who own vineyards are rich, uh, and I mean, <laughs> not all of them, but the, 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 you know, Chris built his vegetable farm, I don't know, I'm imagining you built your vegetable farm from the ground up starting with small acreage, and yeah. I'm sure that you did the same, Melissa, and, and vineyards don't work that way. There are very, very few vineyards that are planted by someone with a dream and no money. That's not how vineyards work. They're, they're, you want me to elaborate on that? Well, I don't think you're <laughs> well, why aren't they facing similar complaints? Oh, yeah. complaints? Yeah, yeah. I thought you were talking about economics. Yeah, no. So why aren't they facing similar complaints? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, if you want to look at them as, as uh, part of the drug industry, which I do, uh, you know, vineyards, I mean, we're producing alcohol. It's, it's not that different. Um, we don't have big, noisy greenhouses, and we're not paving over class one soils. Uh, so that's that's why. You have frost fans, though. Yeah, yeah, we do. Bird so do the pear guys. So we're kind of grandfathered in with some of the luxuries of, that, that our forefathers have, you know, established. Um, and there's a two thousand year, you know, history of viticulture. Um, it's sort of the social cachet, for better or worse, I'm not saying it's it's right, but for better or worse, there's no stigma with wine unless, you know, not to the same degree. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. So this could be for anybody, um, and I think someone must have used this language because the question came up, what does synergy with food farmers mean? So I'm not sure which of you used the term synergy between the two industries? Anyone want to talk about it? You could both come up. Mm -hmm. All three of you. <laughs> so um, what I meant by synergy is the two working together and feeding off one another. Um, I think uh, Chris Jagger has a, a great example of someone who is focusing on food farming, um, but's also using his knowledge and resources to interlink with the cannabis farmers, um, help them develop better practices, um, help develop revenue for his systems from cannabis farmers to support his food farming. And I think, um, you know, working together and bridging the gap is going to make a, just a better system overall. I think one thing the cannabis industry really needs is uh, to move out of some of the old methodologies that are really energy intensive and wasteful and mimic some of the practices that uh, food farmers have already ironed out over the last hundreds of years. And so, yeah, that's, that's the synergy I speak of is just kind of a linking of arms, a sharing of knowledge, a sharing of practices, um, hopefully spending each other's revenue on each other's crops to help support one another and benefiting the community as a whole. Yeah, I think one example of synergy that I've experienced is I've become a better vegetable farmer now that I've interacted with a lot of the cannabis community because I've, I've started thinking of it as, an, as agriculture and the cannabis community has, is my R&D branch, you know, my research and development branch because they had the time, the energy, the money to be able to test and try all these methodologies that I just don't have the time or money to do. And so I can tap into this network of people and say like, really, you can do that with this and you can do that with that. And then, and then I'm sharing information back with them saying, no, this is how you hook up a tiller to your tractor, you know, and, <laughs> which it's, it's huge. It's, it's huge. And, and so that, that's the synergy that I experience, and, and it's really beneficial. And I, I think it, 
once I realize it's all lumped under agriculture and Oregon agriculture, and it's something that we have here that's like very, uh, very unique. I mean, this is the bet. This is honestly the best region in the world to grow anything. So, I mean, I, I think that that synergy should continue. This question is very specifically for you, Michael. Um, although others of you may have interest in the question, um, the question was very simple. What will keep the price up now that it's legal? <laughs> Um, I mean, in short, it's not going to stay up. Um, prices are coming down fast. Uh, the price of cannabis has been in a bubble um, forever. And uh, with the lack of scarcity, and now we're moving towards surplus in the cannabis industry, prices are going to come down and margins are going to get slim. Um, if you want to keep your price up, uh, quality is the main differentiator. So those who grow really high quality using organic practices and then, you know, utilizing traditional uh, business methods, you know, creating a brand, doing marketing, doing outreach to your consumers and, and really building an identity around your product beyond just kind of a nameless bud. Um, those are the things you can do to keep your price up. But the, if you are a cannabis farmer, the prices you've seen in the past are, are not going to be there in the future. and you know, that's what happens with uh, commodity farming. The question doesn't address recreational, but um, it does say that it is legal. But I think there's an important distinction to make. This is something I said in, in my segment was, you've got, we, we can't turn a blind eye to bootlegging because as my understanding is talking to medical growers and rec growers who I know, which are, are many, um, the medical, you know, the rec, what he's talking about is very, very true. You know, you can see rec prices drop. But when you've got bootlegging happening, you don't see the price drop because it's going as an export. So that's, I don't have a solution for that, but that's where, that's why I was saying you will see the most sustainable growth, most sustainable market as, as illegal operations or those, you know, sending their excess medical out of state. Here's a question for any of you that feel called. <clears throat> How can we encourage or foster a climate that helps both cannabis and veggie? I'll take a stab at that, a couple of thoughts. Um, one I just heard from our panelists, uh, which is civil conversation, which doesn't happen very often. I don't mean that very seriously. I don't think it happens very often at all. Uh, I think we, we look for ways to reinforce our feelings and our thoughts and we surround ourselves by individuals who can help us do that but we don't have a lot of civil conversation with individuals to whom we don't under, for whom we we don't understand their their perspective or their background uh, and so i think in part uh, what will help the industries that we have in the room today grow is by us uh, uniting together and helping strengthen our economy in our region uh, and that's going to require us to have civil conversation uh, the other thing I would comment about is is something I see frequently. Uh, I, I've done a lot of work in uh, in grocery stores, so I do a lot of consumer questionnaires, uh, and I do some work on consumer focus groups, trying to get understand why people buy the way they do, way they do. So you've probably witnessed this, and perhaps it's been you, and it's certainly been me at times in my life when you're at a grocery store uh, and you're looking for a commodity of some form. Perhaps you're looking for um, green beans or corn. And what folks do is they typically look for the item that is the cheapest on the shelf. In fact, we teach our children that regularly. I, I certainly see that even in elementary schools. They teach them how to shop consciously by shopping for the cheapest product. But we don't do that when we buy an automobile. Uh, we don't look for the cheapest car out there and then buy that one. We might choose to, but that's not how we, we define ourselves as a conscious consumer. But that's what we do in agriculture almost always. And so if we can help under folks understand that that's not how to be a conscious consumer, I think we can probably improve uh, the economy of the cannabis and food industry in our region. You all have your thoughts together now? You can follow me with more thoughtful I think comments? That's great. Yeah. I think you nailed it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to ask this question. It's a rather complex question, so I'm going to attempt to, um, to I'm going to ask it as it's stated here, and then I'm going to try to uh, get the conversation going here. Can I, uh, 
questions or do you want me to see if anyone else? Yeah, I'll make you end with this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, regenerative, diverse, and localized forms of agriculture are at the front line of counter-corporate chemical and GMO-based food systems. What is being done in our GMO-free valley to move this type of agriculture forward on a broader scale, as we now see with hemp, um, to so that show this could be done also with monocropping, for example, in pears and grapes? Um, so I, I don't understand, uh, well, I understand the question. I, I don't know how we're going to get to the bottom of it in just a few minutes. Um, but one question we can ask from this is, you know, are there thoughts on how to integrate hemp, cannabis production generally, grapes and pears, or grapes or pears, into systems that are not just monocrop fields? Are others of you working on those issues? Mm -hmm. well, make the statement. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, um, yes, there, so we're in agriculture, we're at a, where there's a forefront that we're all figuring out right now through um, regenerative agriculture is the, is the next step, which sustainable agriculture has been the way that so many of us have tried to be for so long. And then we realized that just sustaining doesn't just do it. We have to regenerate, we have to create more than what we started with. Um, and so there are a lot of systems for that now, whether it be, and I, and I don't think that any one way is the best way to do it. I think integrating permaculture and low and no-till systems and look at uh, reduced water usage irrigation systems and figuring out any of these crops that, that, are, that you mentioned, um, any of them can be put into any of these systems. It's just figuring out how to do it um, like you said, in a profitable manner. Um, and setting up that system uh, is one thing, and then having the labor to back it up is another. So I think that labor is something that we're just gonna keep coming back to here in this conversation. So um, I, I fully know how I'm going to formulate my farm to be what, what it's gonna look like in the next 20 years. I mean, I've been a row crop vegetable farmer for 20 years. And I'm finally starting to look at how I can have a holistic system that's perennialized, annualized, and producing cash crops that can support my family and my workers. But if I don't have the labor to do that, then it makes it really challenging to implement that. So I don't know, does that kind of answer what you're getting at? So just to address the monocrop in pears and grapes, uh, I think I've seen two vineyards and zero orchards that are monocropped. Uh, every vineyard or orchard that I know of, minus those two, has either a perennial or annual cover crop, um, often flowering, often managed to be uh, encouraging biodiversity. Um, so just briefly, I just wanted to say, um, you know, in the regulated cannabis industry right now, there's really stringent controls on what pesticides you can apply to your crop. And there's testing involved with all of the cannabis products. And um, that, that separates it from the conventional food and, and vineyard and, and orchard industries where you can use a lot harsher chemicals to combat pests. And so with, um, with less you know, weapons in the arsenal, I guess, uh, to be able to combat pests in a monoculture like cannabis, um, it makes us start to consider things like perennial planting and companion planting to try and attract beneficial insects and to be able to create a healthier environment. And so um, our farm this year just went on a large uh, perennial companion planting project. Um, we planted over 500 perennial plants um, all around the perimeter and uh, right next to some of our, our cannabis crops in hopes of just creating more biodiversity and a, a healthier ecosystem. And this last year we saw a large amount of the cannabis grown uh, fail for banned pesticides once it came to market, like a large amount, millions and millions of dollars worth failed and went into quarantine. And so the more that happens, I think there's going to be a, a push to diversify and to move away from monoculture and, um, you know, cover cropping and uh, perennial planting are just two ways that we can do that. 
I'm going to ask this final question of our panelists, and then we're hopeful that we can engage you briefly uh, in an opportunity to engage in this conversation through some regional community-based conversations in your, in your hometowns, we hope. So the question was posed, and this is a common one we've seen many times. Um, it reads, uh, traffic use on rural Josephine County roads has vastly increased uh, over a recent past, causing safety and wildlife concerns. What regulatory mechanisms can be utilized to address these problems? <laughs> So I can't necessarily speak to what can be done regulatory wise to handle what's going on on the roads, but I think there's something to acknowledge that's that's often not understood. Um, when cannabis was legalized in Oregon, something similar has happened to, uh, in other states as well in Colorado, which is that a lot of people move here to grow cannabis, but not under the licensed paradigm, um, bootleggers. There's many, many people that have come to Oregon, Williams, Josephine County in the last two years to come here and grow cannabis who are not licensed producers. And what I see out in Williams is a lot of the community is upset about the influx and they're not understanding the difference you know between correlation and causation yes there's a correlation that there's been an influx since recreational marijuana has been legalized but the causation is not on licensed producers and i think that needs to be understood so there's a lot of people flying around on the roads there's a lot of people who um, are not good community members who've come into town who, who don't care about the local culture the ecosystem um, but Blaming that on the advent of recreational marijuana is a mistake, and I think that needs to be understood. Well, I'm, I'm glad that that was finally brought up because I was just in Williams yesterday driving around, and it's very apparent that there are a lot of grows, most of which are not probably permitted either as medical or recreational, commercial recreational. So the, the impacts we're talking about, I think, have a lot to do with the evolving nature of this industry right now. And I like to use the term the Wild West. You know, it's it seems like this, it, it's obvious that this is a new thing, uh, especially at the magnitude in which you're seeing it and the degree that which you're, the communities are seeing this. It will evolve over time and I think part of the evolution is going to be the enforcement of the illegal grows that are out there. So right now, um, a lot of the, and I don't pretend to be an expert here, so this is gonna be pretty general. Um, a lot of the revenue uh, that's been, been um, Get, that the state's been getting from the cannabis industry has been sitting there. They haven't been acting on it right now. It's my understanding that that when they do start to utilize the money from an enforcement standpoint, they're going to be enforcing the illegal grows. And I think that's going to have a lot to do with um, with the, the impacts and, and lessen the impacts that you're, you all are seeing in your community. Um, I had was sitting on another panel and this question came up and it's a big I think a big difference between Josephine County and Jackson County and the minimizing the impacts is the fact that Jackson County has regulation on it I mean it's not perfect and there's certainly some kinks with it but I think that a big part of it is that Josephine County doesn't have any regulation when you have no regulation it's a lot it's really hard to enforce something that's not in writing and essentially um, I know as far as is this the question where's the question is it? Um, I do know that Jackson County Roads uh, Department is currently trying to figure out some um, ways to help minimize some of the impacts to their roads. Um, they they can't really do anything about private roads because, and that's I think where, where a big concern comes in because private roads are privately owned and maintained. Um, but in terms of doing uh, in, on public impact road or publicly public roads being impacted by some of the traffic that's being generated, they are actually now requiring that a lot of people um, pave their aprons to their driveways to help mitigate the amount of gravel that comes onto the public roads. So they're trying to take small steps. There's not a whole lot that they can do for some of the other private roads, though. Please join me in thanking our panelists tonight.